I thank you very much for your, your hospitality and I thank Beverly for her presentation. Actually, I didn't deserve so much honors, but anyway, I will accept them. <laughs> and uh, I apologize also for my bad English, but I hope in your cooperation so you could have a mutual understanding. As uh, Beverly pointed out, my present interest is in studying how elementary components of the matter, atom, molecules, electrons, whatever you, uh, you, you consider, could collect themselves in order to produce a macroscopic piece of matter. You know that in the present century, the main course in science was just the opposite. Science started from considering a macroscopic piece of matter and split macroscopic matter deeper and deeper in order to find out what were the elementary bricks. So there, before there were atoms, after we learned that atoms can be further split in nuclei and electrons. Electrons cannot be split anymore, but nuclei can. Nuclei can be split into protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons can be in some sense split because some other particle could emerge from them. And in the last decades, physicists learned that the most elementary bricks are quarks. But quarks had the, a strange property. They cannot come out alone from inside the elementary particle. They are condemned to go always around into tight, tightly knit packets. They are really collective beings. They cannot never act as individuals. That's the universally accepted vision now. And that's put, in a sense, a, a ceiling, or a floor, if you prefer, <laughs> to, <laughs> to the uh, to the possibility of further splitting matter. So we have split enough. Now we, we want to collect again. Consider, for instance, a boy or a girl who has a toy. He wants to see the toy inside. He splits and splits and splits. When all pieces are on the desk, now time is ripe for trying to collect again the piece and reconstruct the same toy or another toy who works reasonably well as the, previ uh, the previous one. So now we are at this stage. We must learn how to collect again piece of, of matter in order to produce a meaningful, a meaningful, I use the word meaningful in an absolutely pre-scientific way, uh, in a meaningful array which appear macroscopically to our, our eyes and our sensors. OK, that's the program. The, a very wide scope program. Of course, we, uh, the things we can do is just focusing on some aspect of this very vast program, which could be a century program in, uh, in a sense. And you know that uh, modern scientists have basically two main tools in their armory. They have relativity, and they have quantum theory. Relativity is particularly suitable for range where speed is very important, high speed compared to the speed of light. And that is quite separate for our common day experience. Quantum theory is commonly believed to be a theory which applied to very, very little dimension. People usually think to quantum theory as suitable for understanding elementary particles or nuclei, atoms, but not for understanding elephants, hippopotamus, and so on, where it is supposed that a classical theory is enough. Actually, this is a widespread opinion, but I have reason to think that this is not true that the limit of applicability of quantum theory is not the infinitely small, this is 
a misconception who originated by a great man, Niels Bohr, but this is not true actually. But quantum theory is the limit of an unknown, let's say, as exact theory, we don't know, but is the limit of the truth towards the ordered state of matter, or if you prefer, if we speak of temperature as an indication of the disorder of matter, the quantum theory is a low temperature limit of, of a theory. So when temperature is particularly low, or where we are, as in a biological system, near to ordered states, then quantum theory becomes particularly important. Actually, quantum theories work so well in atoms, not because atoms are small, but because atoms are cold. <laughs> that, that, that is the...